Yeah, all right. Back to uh, chapter eight, back to memory, and and sort of our tour, I guess you'll say, through the various memory systems. Just trying to give you a sense of these different systems that we think of as related to memory, but each playing a different role. And so we'll think about each um, and, and then try to put it all together. Uh, and we're going to do a little bit of that actually right now, today. So let's go to this one. Pew. Lecture 8 for immediate or working memory. Sometimes this is also called short-term memory. Sometimes it's called consciousness. Um, so let's walk you through it. Let's go back to this. Um, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to start you with this question. And we're going to use multiple memory systems to answer this. But, but let me just ask you this question. How high could you reach while sitting on the back of a camel? Let's say for some reason somebody asked you that question. Um, what would your answer be? Take a second. And, but, but, but as you take a second, introspect. Um, kind of pay attention to what's happening in your mind as you try to answer that. Okay, so go ahead and try to answer. I'm going to do it too. Let me see. You ready? I'm, I'm going to say something like, for me, 10, 10 and a half feet is what I think. How do you come to that? What, what was going through your head when you did that? Um, I, I'll tell you what was going through my head. I think, okay, first of all, I'm going to be sitting on the back of a camel. How tall is the back of a camel? right? Because that's where my butt's going to be. So how tall is the, is the back of a camel? And so then when I try to answer that question, I kind of think of seeing camels on TV with people walking beside them and kind of getting a sense of how tall is the human relative to the back of the camel. Uh, I've seen that on TV a few times. Actually, even in the zoo, I remember that camel ride and I've been, you know, close to a camel. And based on those experiences, I would say, based on those memories, I would say about six feet is the top of a back of a camel. Okay, cool. Now, me sitting on a camel. Well, now I, I'm thinking, okay, what, what do I know about the height basically from my butt up? Well, I know I can figure out my butt to my head because I'm not, I know I'm six foot three and I know my legs have a 36 inch inseam, ridiculously freaky legs. Uh, so that means that I have another 36 inches plus another three. So a 39 inches above that or or three foot three inches you could say so that's to the top of my head right so from the from the camel if that's six and now we're up to about three three and a half to the top of my head now it's about nine and a half how far higher than the top of my head can I reach well I can kind of look at that and say well that's at least a foot at least a foot maybe a foot and a half and that's brought me to my ten and a half eleven feet that I could reach okay I don't know what you did but that gives you an idea so now let's go to here Back to our modal model of memory. <laughs> um, and we're going to mostly be floating around in this, in this part of it this time. So we said, you know, there can be input from the world. And if there's input from the world, that's head by, held by sensory memory. But we weren't really talking about a whole lot of input from the world here. We were, first of all, using this part of the system. So you see here it's labeled short-term memory. It's also called immediate memory. It's also called working memory. Um, why all these labels? Well, it kind of went through, I, I would say working memory is now the most common term that's used for this. And it's used because this is the place where the mind does its work. Um, and so why did we call it short-term memory? Well, let me just give you, give you an example for the, for the short-term memory one to kind of think about. Uh, I'm going to give you seven digits. I'm just going to write down um, seven digits. Um, I'll do six because most people can do six. Okay. Um, and so I'm just going to read these and then we're going to just hold on to them for a little while. So I'm going to ask you, don't write them down. Don't do anything. Just, just try to keep these numbers alive. And then I will say recall and you tell me what those numbers are. Okay. You ready? Pretty easy. Two, five, seven, three, five, eight. Okay, recall. What did you notice happening 
what you probably noticed was was something going on in your mind. Um, it's something we're going to call the phonological loop, a little voice in your head saying two, five, seven, three, five, eight, two, five, seven, three, five, eight, two, five, seven, three, five, eight, until I said recall. And then you said, ah, two, five, seven, three, five, eight. Um, you were keeping that information alive for a short period of time, just holding on to it for a short term until you could release it again. This used to be a thing we did quite a bit with things like telephone numbers. We'd tell someone our telephone number and they'd be like, oh, okay. And then they'd have to keep it alive until they could write it down. Um, you know, things like that. And so that was the time when people said, well, what memory system are we using to keep things alive for a short period of time? Uh, and they called that short-term memory. But we've now come to understand this part in a lot more detail and that's the story you're going to learn today and we know that it's a whole does a whole lot more than just keep stuff alive um, it is the place where we generally solve problems that we're solving at least in a conscious way okay it's where we work through things in our mind and that's why it's gotten this working memory um, notion to it so Let's first of all, just come back to the, you know, how tall can you, can you reach sitting on a camel? Well, that's a question I gave you, a problem, right? And you didn't know the answer to that. But this is the thing. We can use the information we do know, and we can bring it together in new and novel ways to answer new and novel questions. So that question was a new novel question. Um, again, you've never thought of it before. You never stored the answer to that before, but you can kind of figure it out. And this is the system we use to figure stuff out. Um, now, one of the things you'll notice is that it dances very much with our long-term memory system. And let's just make some of those points clear. The long-term memory system is information we know that we have stored away and that we can use anytime we want. So when I was doing this problem, when I was talking to this problem, talking it out with you, I said things like, well, first I want to know how tall a camel is. And I remember certain things. I remember watching TV shows with people walking with camels. Um, and that, I can retrieve that information and I can use that. I can say, okay, it was like, you know, to the top of their head sort of. And if they were about six feet tall, it's about six feet tall, right? I also mentioned going to a zoo and seeing a camel and I could bring that memory back. And so I can use this information that I remember. I mentioned my inseam is 36 inches. This is something I just know. I can use that information. I, I mentioned I'm six foot three. Again, information I know that I can bring in. But of course, the really interesting thing is how I was putting all of this information together. That was happening here, right? And so this system, and we're going to go into a little more detail in it in just a moment, can use information from the real world, including, by the way, the problem came from the real, real world, right? That was on a slide. That was from me asking you that question. So that was actually input. And so you brought that problem, that question, and now you used information in your memory and you brought this all together to do a solution. Anywhere along the way, by the way, we could lose some of this information. I didn't, I didn't highlight this forgetting sort of step that can happen, but that can happen as well. Okay, let's get into this one a little bit more. Okay, we have this working memory system that we can use to solve things, to work through things. Um, let's, let's get a sense of, of what's there. Okay. So it's, it's thought to be composed of a couple of components that work together. And I'm going to walk you through a couple of these components. And the first one is going to be related to things like imagery. Okay. So I love this sort of notion. Think of a small house or small building that you know, well, perhaps the house you grew up in, or even the home you're in now, any relatively small building that you know pretty well. And now I'm just going to ask you a question about that. How many doors are inside this building? Okay. Go ahead. Pay attention to what's going on in your mind as you do this. You can do that, by the way, because we can pay attention to working memory. It is what's going on in our mind. So chances are what you did is in your mind went into that building. You might have started on the outside. You might have started, I'm going to do it with my childhood home. There was a door in the front. There was a door in the back upstairs. You could go upstairs to a door in the, to get in the upper floor in the back. There was a sliding door at the, at the basement of the back. So there's three doors to get into the house, 
But now, how many doors are inside the building? Uh, you know, it, it, let's say we don't even count the ones that go in. How many are actually inside? Okay, well, now I have to go in. And so in my mind, I in my house, I go in and it's a split-level house, so I have to go up to the left at first, and I'm kind of looking around in my, in my mind's eye, and really the only doors are on this hallway to the right, and there's one into the bathroom, one into my parents' bedroom, one into another bedroom. I think there might be a closet door. So that I think there's four doors upstairs and then I could go downstairs and I could say, okay, sewing room, there's five, six, one to the laundry room, seven, one to the bathroom down there, eight, there's a little closet, that's nine, there's two other bedrooms, 10, 11, 11 doors in that house. Okay, here's the more important part of that. What are you doing in your mind? I mean, it's not that you're hallucinating, right? You're not like there, like, whoa, you're there. But it's something like that. It's something like going into some sort of virtual reality world of imagery where we can actually move around that world and see things. Look, now, of course, when we're looking, it's memory that's feeding us the information, right, of what was actually there. That's from our memory. But we're going through this visual kind of thing. And that's sort of your mind's eye. And we're going to call that the visual spatial scratch pad, okay? So what, what you're seeing over here is we're taking that working memory, that little box that just said working memory or immediate memory, but now we're showing you the various components of it. And one component is this visual spatial scratch pad, our ability to use visual information. In fact, when I was doing the camel question. I was imagining a camel. I was imagining me sitting on the camel. That's what made me, for example, think, oh, I have to know how it is, how high it is from my butt to my head. Because when you do that image, okay, that's part of what you're adding, right? So we have this ability to use imagery and, and use it in a problem solving kind of way. That's kind of cool. Notice there's these other bits here too. Um, let's, let's go to the other major one that people talk about, the voice inside your head. Um, Quick little aside, you know, when you learn about schizophrenia, you'll learn that a defining feature is that schizophrenics often hear voices in their head. Theoretically, that defines them as being schizophrenic. Well, not really. I mean, we all hear voices in our head. Our thoughts sometimes come in the form of voices. Remember that number that I asked you to remember? And you could hear that number over and over again. That's a voice in your head. We all hear voices in our head. We just... If we're not schizophrenic, we kind of own the voices. We kind of think that's our voice talking to ourself. We think we're in control of that voice. A schizophrenic might not. For a schizophrenic, it might sound like somebody else is speaking to them. And that's what gives it that sort of different vibe. But we speak to ourselves all the time. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, can, I can do the number thing again. And, and we will do it again. Why not? Um, but this time we're going to pay attention to that voice. So listen to the following list of numbers, but only listen. I will stop reading, but don't do anything until I say go. Until then, just remember the numbers. Um, so yeah, I, I did numbers last, last time. Let's, let's do letters this time. Um, Okay. Once again, I'm doing six. We'll get back to six in a moment, but I'm going I'm to do six. And so I'm just going to read these letters, and then I'm going to stop. Don't do anything until I then say go, and then go ahead and tell me what those letters were. Go ahead and spit them out or write them down or whatever you want to do. Okay. All right. Here we go. A, P, Z, Q, R, F. A, P, Z, Q, R, F, A, P, Z. Yeah, go. Sorry, go. <laughs> what, what, what I was just simulating there, but while giving you the answer at the same time, was what you probably saw or felt in your head. You felt, you know, A, P, Z, Q, R, F, A, P, Z, Q, R, F. You weren't saying it out loud, but you know what? If we looked at the muscles of your voice we would see that they are moving very, very slightly, but in the exact same way they would be if you were reading it out loud. So in a very muted way, we are using our voice and we're saying those things over and over again to our, uh, ourselves, okay? Um, so here's a set of numbers. I won't use these numbers, um, but you can try that with anybody else. This refers to this part, what we call the phonological loop. 
And this is really when they talked about short-term memory. Remember when I talked about they called it short-term memory? It was the phonological loop they were really at first really impressed by. You know, that voice in our head that speaks things. And, and every now and then, you know, when we're working through things, we do talk to ourselves or we will occasionally use the loop. The loop we use especially to keep something alive, just like we've been doing. You know, here's a set of numbers and, and now you have to keep them alive for a while. We'll use that loop and repeat it to ourselves a lot. Um, and so that's another big part of this. Um, I don't know, more numbers. <laughs> okay, so... Um, we also have these other parts. So the phonological loop can be broken down into the articulatory loop, the actual looping thing, and the store of what's being looped. We won't go into that in a lot of detail. Um, there's also the idea of what we call the episodic buffer. That's kind of remembering what you're doing in the first place. You know, what, what, what is this problem you're solving? So in our episodic buffer would have been how tall can you reach while sitting on a camel? You have to keep that alive. Oh yeah, this is what I'm trying to solve. But then you use these other components to solve it. And up above all of this, we sometimes refer to the central executive, that something within the system is orchestrating how these things play out. When you use images, when you use words, how you use them, how you combine them to make that. Now, the central executive is always one of these mysterious things. We don't necessarily understand how all that stuff is coordinated, how conscious thought is coordinated. But we know it has to be coordinated, and therefore there must be some algorithm or some set of rules that does so. We want to be very careful not to reduce psychology to another little human in the head. You know, we don't want to get to the point of saying, okay, there's some some entity in your head that's making these decisions for you, um, because then... You know, we've just taken the problem and brought it down into your head. We want to understand how it's doing that. Um, I can't say that we do at this point in time, um, but uh, these are the, what are thought to be the components of the system that we use to think through stuff. Now, I've been using six numbers, and you see on these ones too, it was six. Let me talk to you a little bit about why. So... And, we're, and yeah, we're going to get a little bit more into this working memory. So first of all, there was a very important paper published by a guy named Jeff Miller called The Magic Number 6, Plus or Minus 2. And what he was referring to there is how many items can a person actually remember? If you keep giving them more items to remember, I was giving you 6, but what if I asked you to try to remember 7, or 8, or 9, or 10? Well, it turns out there's a limit. There's a max that you can do. And for most people, that maximum is around seven. So we've been using six in our examples because I wanted you to succeed. I wanted you to be able to do it. But some of you may have found six even a challenge because it's seven plus or minus two. So your average human being can do somewhere between five and nine that they can hold on to. It turns out the more you can hold on to in your mind, the higher your IQ. Those two are related. Correlation. Um, but when you think about it, the more that you can hold in your mind at a time, well, the more complex your thought processes can be, right? You can be combining more bits of information, which might, which, which, which might explain why you are ultimately able to reach higher levels of intelligence. Okay. So first, of, one thing I want to mention is we sometimes think of, of, of this memory system like a kind of conveyor belt that has a certain capacity. And so maybe for this individual, it's six items, okay? And so they can kind of be thinking about six items at a time. And the notion is if you bring in a new item, then that's going to push something that was in there off the other end because it can only hold six. So if your mind gets distracted or pulled somewhere else, then something that was in your mind gets lost um, for, for that new thing that comes in. And this is a, a bunch of experiments. I'd love to show you all the experiments that they use to kind of get to these conclusions. Um, but that would take quite a while. Uh, but this is, this is what we currently believe right now. So let me give you one example um, that some of you have probably experienced uh, that really kind of messes, that, that shows you how... Yeah. Okay, here's the example. Let's say you work in some retail place. I don't know if any of you have, like selling whatever, but if you do, one of the jobs at the end of your shift typically is to count your cash. So for the rest of you, just think of counting any, you know, counting money or counting something. Um, 
But but in the real tail industry, you got to count your cash. You got to cash out. How much cash do you have in your cash register? One of the things that people love to do um, is while one person is counting, so I'm like, okay, 57, 87, 87, somebody else starts just throwing out numbers. 42, 68, 25. (laughs) If you do work in a place where someone counts cash, do that (laughs) when they're counting cash. They will hate you for it. The first thing they'll do is go... Because they, because conscious memory, this this kind of working memory is very sensitive to to um, distraction. It can only hold so much, and it takes effort to kind of hold and think things. And so, when somebody else is b- trying to push other information or distract you, it's hard because you know that's your first thing. You don't want to be distracted, but it's even worse if they're distracting you with a stimulus. That's like the stimulus you're dealing with. So if I'm counting and I'm going 21, 22, 23, 24, and then somebody goes 14, 18, 76, and I'm trying to keep hold of this 23, 24, it gets tricky. And those other items can get into my memory and can totally mess me up and can get me to the point where I'm like, oh, crap, I got to start over again. Thanks to you. I've lost count. Um, it's very sensitive to interference in that way. It's a lot of fun. You can try this with other people. Ask them to remember a set of numbers just like we did. But then while they're... Oh, let's do it ourselves. Ah, what the heck. Let's do it ourselves. Um, let me do one more set of numbers. Um, and... Um, okay, I've made these double-digit numbers, but I'm only going to do four of them. So it should be easy, right? 12, 18... 32, 24. Remember those. 35, 17, 52. Ignore me now. 78, 49. Just keep remembering those first numbers. 22, 35, 17. There's just four of them. Four. Okay, what were those numbers? (laughs) Really annoying, huh? Really annoying. Those numbers were 12, 18, 32, 24. Um, But again, you know, you can do this with other people and you get a sense of how fragile that memory system is. Okay. And so we call it working memory because it takes work. You have to really focus your attention and, and consciously work through a problem with it. And you're very sensitive to distraction. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is experiencing it all coming, coming together. So as we work with our working memory, we also experience that the work is happening. Think of the door thing, how many doors, think of the camel. You're actually having a conscious experience, right? Um, the combining of the various information, uh, to solve the problem. And again, that's the episodic buffer, right? So you're keeping in mind what your problem you're trying to solve. And as these things are sort of fitting into place, you're, you're kind of keeping track of everything with your episodic buffer. Um, and so that's the place where it all comes together. And then, yeah, who's controlling all this? Well, we usually use working memory to solve some problems. And that requires someone or something to direct the search and the how these things get combined. We call this the homunculus problem. So we're talking about the central executive here, of course. And we call this the homunculus problem because homunculus means little man. And, and the idea is when you put it just like I put it here, it sounds like we're saying, okay, and then there's this little guy in there that controls it all. This is always called the homunculus problem in psychology, and it's considered a bad thing. If you get to a point where you're basically postulating there's a little man in the person's head, then you're not showing a whole lot of understanding because, I mean, the person's a big person to start with, a big human. Um, And if you have to have a little human in their head to explain things, you haven't gone anywhere. And so this is a challenge for a lot of research now is to try to understand how the central executive does what it does uh, and to be able to specify that in terms of like an algorithm or something like that, not in terms of, you know, another entity inside the person's head. Okay. lot of work (laughs) to answer a question like this. Um, But I hope now you you have a sense of that that part of the of the memory system. You know what the working memory part is doing and how it interacts with long-term memory especially um, but also input from the real world to kind of help us solve problems, new problems. This is our conscious mind in action trying to solve new problems. So we call it working memory most commonly, also short-term memory, also immediate memory, but mostly working memory. And I hope you have a really good sense of what it does for you now. Um, Yeah. All right. Gonna leave that one there. Thanks. Bye bye.